Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bowling University studio from the International Bowling Campus here in Arlington, Texas. This is The Profit Break. If you're joining us for the first time, we're glad you're here. Give us 15 minutes, and you're going to be well on your way to improving yourself and your profitability. Food and beverage plays a critical role in your business model, regardless of what that model is. Now, you may not have started out to be in the food business when you got in the bowling business, but guess what? You are in the food business. In fact, food plays a role in the potential guests visiting you, and when they do visit you, what the spend is. With so much on the line, you don't want to guess what type of F&B you should be offering your guests. Now, good news, today's guest is going to help us make the best decision for your food and beverage operation. David Wallace is the founder of Turfway Entertainment Management Group. David and the Turfway team have worked on over 90 successful projects throughout North America, helping operators minimize risk and do it right the first time and turn their dreams into reality. David, thank you for joining us. Great to see you again. Hey, Bart. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. So, hey, let's jump right in here. So uh, as you're working with clients of all different shapes and sizes around the country, let's start off with what are some of the top sellers? What are the things you're seeing in the food space now? Because it feels like we've turned into a foodie nation. Yeah, I mean, we have definitely. And when we look at opportunity, um, you know, when, when we look at the entertainment world, uh, we've tried everything from vegan food to uh, gluten-free, free range, a little bit of everything, but everything gravitates back to four items, pizzas, burgers, wings, and tenders. It's really, I mean, throwing them on a plate is or throwing them on a paper plate isn't really a path forward anymore. You can take those four items and really decorate them up into different, different ways with plateware and different sauces and what have you. We still do outliers for sure, such as, um, you know, rice bowls and charcuterie boards and hummus, but you know, 70% of your audience are going are, are gonna to gravitate to those four items generally. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, you can do a lot with those four items. So uh, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but I heard you say something that I think I want to dive a little deeper into, and that is this paper. When I used to go to the supermarket, they would ask you, paper or plastic? Now, in our space, you know, as an operator, you've got to think about paper or China. Which is the best path and why? Yeah, definitely. I mean, paper supplies, as you guys know, aren't cheap. Uh, you spend a lot of money. Everyone decides to go disposables uh, for many, many years. But now with melamine coming out, plateware in China, or you know, you can get a round plastic bowl and put a logoed parchment sheet underneath it, dressing that up a little bit more with reuse opportunities will save you a lot more money. A lot of people don't realize when you start looking at, for instance, silverware, the cheapest form of silverware, which it's still silverware, I can get 12 forks for a dollar. So if I can reuse that a lot, uh, many times over by having a three compartment sink or a single dump low temp uh, dishwasher that I can rent from Eco or Ecolab or Cisco in my kitchen, um, I'm going to save a lot of money over the course of a year and or course of a year, and I'm going to offer a better presentation for my um, for my guest. And that better presentation means higher prices. If I take the same, you know, burger and put it on a paper plate, a cheap white paper plate, versus uh, dressing it up a little bit with, you know, a, a decent plateware, uh, the visual effect of that is worth a few more bucks. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that you mentioned the visual effect because we eat with our eyes, right? I mean, it's and and it just the the what you see already predetermines a lot of times what the you know the product's going to taste like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So this may not be a fair question, but while I have the expert, I'm going to ask it anyway. What are your general assumptions? There's a lot of different type of FECs, but uh, what works best? You mentioned the big four, but what works best in the different type of models? When it comes to food service part? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, different ways to look at it. We're opening a place in Portland, up in the area of, of our Portland, Oregon, and we're opening a place down in Mississippi, and we just opened one in Arkansas. You know, if I can pay an employee tip, tip minimum wage of $2.13 an hour, that's going to be your best path, best path is full service. And the reason for that, if I do 11 steps of service, as a dining experience, whether it's on the bowling lanes or, you know, if I have a restaurant or, 
you know, wherever there's food service, it could be through ax throwing and what have you. Um, I have the opportunity to suggest to sell appetizers, entrees, desserts, upsell drinks, and tell them about, you know, what else we have going on in the environment. So they become a marketing ploy. Uh, that's the best opportunity. But for instance, I'm doing one, a project in Denver right now that'll have duck pen and I'm working on their financials and their tip minimum wage is $14 and 30 cents. So it's almost seven times the amount of the one that we open in Conway, Arkansas. That one, uh, there's just no way that I could have as many servers on. Uh, so what we go, what we're going to do there is, is a cue card or is a, um, uh, we're going to do a, a quick casual menu uh, where they walk up and order and then we'll bring it out to them when they're ready. The problem with that in our eyes is I'm never going to have anyone, whether it's a QR code or a quick casual, that's going to order an appetizer, walk up, wait for it to come back, eat it, say, all right, let's go get an entree, do it again. Oh, let's go do it, get a dessert, do it again. So you really limit to a one-time opportunity at that table without a higher means of suggested selling. Now you can do it through a QR code and what have you and kind of pace them. But the general um, analysis that we see is there's just a one-time shot, which eliminates uh, almost 50% of your revenue versus a full service type atmosphere. And then when you go to a concession type atmosphere, your costs are usually higher. And a lot of people don't, when you start digging into the numbers, a lot of people don't take the kitchen man hours. Um, how much does it cost for that one item to come out of the kitchen uh, versus the food costs? A lot of people have them on separate line items, but you really have to understand the full impact of that cost per per item coming out of the kitchen. And the, the snack bar menus are generally the highest cost with the lowest revenue because you don't charge near as much for a snack bar item as you would for a full service dining experience. Well, definitely a lot to consider there and some great uh, things to get us uh, thinking about and started in, in that area. So let's get in the weeds here a little bit while, while I have you, because many of uh, folks join us today, our existing facilities, you know, they kind of have the footprint they have to work with. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between vented and ventless kitchens and costs associated with this? If someone maybe has limited on space, is that an option? Absolutely. I mean, we did a project in, called Stratosphere Social in Ellersburg, Maryland. They had a 600 square foot space. Now, 600 square feet for a kitchen is tight, uh, but they do over a million dollars worth of food in a ventless kitchen in 600 square feet. So it can be done. Uh, a ventless kitchen is one without a hood and a very small internal grease trap where you don't have to dig down into a ground into the ground. If I do a vented kitchen, um, you know, uh, I I can get a lot more food out of there. Uh, a, a good size kitchen generally is about fifteen hundred to to seventeen hundred square feet. Unless you got a lot of corporate events, I could easily go up to twenty five hundred square feet. When it comes to cost, the cost of a ventless kitchen right now, without the construction side of it, because there's a lot of critical factors that go into that, is uh, equipment-wise is about $110,000. I can do a full vented kitchen for about double, about $220,000. Now, remember, if I'm a ventless kitchen, I want to make sure uh, the four critical items to cook are burgers, tenders, wings, and pizzas. And some of those are fried items. A lot of people go to what we call or go to air fryers or, you know, some of these the, some of these quick serve products. But during your peak times, your peak performance, that might not be adequate. Because if I have, for instance, a five or five pound air fryer for French fries, when you start digging into the details, you only get about two and a half pounds in there because of how they're elongated. The French fries are elongated. Well, two and a half pounds don't go very far when you're very busy. And that's only one item you have to cook. You know, if they have that and tenders, you're not cooking them together. So you're going to have to have multiple pieces of equipment, which could happen. I mean, there's there's something called a four chamber alto sham that's ventless. I can cook four different items at one time. And 
And that's what Stratosphere Social has. I believe they have three of them lined up together. That's how much food production they go through. But critical factor is during your peak performance or what your peak performance is, you don't want to go beyond 15 minutes or you're going to get some pretty negative Yelp reviews. So um, understanding your kitchen for your environment is critical. Great, uh, uh, great insight there, David. Appreciate you, you sharing that. And what I, what I heard you saying is that even though we may be limited on space, we, we shouldn't just throw up our hands and say, well, you know, I'm not a new build. I don't have the room. I can't do it. I mean, I heard you say that a 600 square foot kitchen is churning out a million dollars in F&B revenue, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But so let's, uh, let's dig into one more why I have you today, and, and that is you mentioned one of the big four, and that's pizzas. So kind of that, that ebb and flow of the pizzas, should it be uh, fresh dough or frozen? And, you know, what's the best solution and, and what considerations do you have conversations with operators as they're thinking about how to prep their pizzas? Yeah, very good question. I mean, when we start looking at pizzas and the impact of birthday parties and how many you need to get out at one time, do not have a third party do it. I can, uh, I can say that again, do not have a third party do it. There's, there's going to be all kinds of challenges with that. When you're going to your kitchen, one of the key aspects of it is dough, fresh dough versus frozen. Fresh dough, trust me, I've been doing it. I've done it for six or seven years. We've moved to frozen. There's a product called Rich's Frozen um, Dough Skins. So it's an actual skin frozen. You open it up, put sauce and cheese on it, put your toppings on it, put it right in the oven, and within five to seven minutes, depending on your temperature, it's done. And it, it will rival any fresh dough product in America. Um, so production-wise, that's your best path, uh, we believe. When you look at pizza ovens, there's the, the, you know, you got conveyor and you have a brick deck. We much rather have a brick deck, and the, unless the conveyor is big enough, which the larger it is, the higher cost. There's some double stack impingers that are $40,000 if you're going to go through that much pizza, where I can put two 16-inch pizzas side by side, that might be an opportunity if I have double stack. We use a product called Peerless, which is relatively inexpensive. Um, I can do a three shelf, um, three shelf stone oven for about electric for about 3,500 or a four shelf gas for about the same price. And I can put two 16 inch pizza side by side times three. And then they all come out at the same time. Think of a conveyor, a single 16 inch conveyor, it can come out in four minutes, but the other one's stacked behind it, and then the other one's stacked behind it, and so on and so forth. So production during your peak performance is critical, and having the right pizza oven for that opportunity is, is what's going to determine success or failure when, when it comes to the food opportunity in your facility. And David, I know you said it twice, but I'm going to say it one more time. Do not use a third party for your pizzas. That's absolutely the, the worst option there is. But great information, Dave. Uh, great to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bart. Thanks for having me. Well, folks, not sure where to start or have additional questions for Dave? You can connect with him on his website, or you can email him at info at turfwayentertainment.com. Now, if you're ready to start improving your profitability, you can reach us anytime at education at bpa.com. As we wrap up another edition of The Profit Break, remember, when you're focused on growing people, people will grow your business. Now, this episode, as well as all our previous Profit Break episodes, available 24-7 for you and the team at BolandUniversity.net. Plus, we have new episodes every month. Mark your calendar, watch your email, join us on Facebook to hear about all the latest episodes. Until then, I'm Bart Berger, and remember, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. We'll see you next time. <laughs>